Hi, I'm Adrian Campbell Washburn, and today I'm going to be talking about some work we've been doing at the NIH using a high performance 0.55T MRI system for cardiopulmonary imaging. And some of you may have already heard of this project, but just briefly to explain what we're doing. We took a Siemens 1.5T MRI system, which was located in the MRI cardiac catheterization lab at the NIH, and we ramped it down to 0.55T. And the reason we took this ramp down approach was because we were interested in exploring what we could do with a high performance, low field MRI system that's equipped, equipped with modern hardware and software. So specifically, we wanted to keep a lot of the modern hardware elements that are available in a contemporary MRI system, but operate them at a lower field strength. And we wanted to integrate some of our advanced image acquisition and reconstruction methods in order to recover image quality at lower field. And on this slide, I'm showing some example images from 0.55T. So specifically, I have examples uh, of neuroimaging, spine imaging, cardiac imaging, and body imaging. And I don't want to spend too much time dwelling on these images, but I just wanted to say that overall, we've been very impressed with the image quality so far at 0.55T. I also wanted to point out that we're not the only people taking this approach. And so there's been a lot of recent work in cardiac MRI using the V-Ray 0.35T system. And this work's been going on both at The Ohio State University as well as UCLA. And here I have some example images comparing uh, image quality at 0.35T to 1.5T and 3T for cine imaging, flow imaging, and parametric mapping. And these images are from The Ohio State University. One of the things that we've been working on since ramping down our system was considering how we can generate optimal image quality at lower field strength. And so when we think about the physical properties of a lower field strength magnet, we have longer T2 and T2 star and shorter T1. And this gives us an opportunity to improve our sampling efficiency. So techniques like spiral, EPI, and rosette trajectories perform very well at low field strength. We can sample data for a prolonged period of time because of the long T2 and T2 star. And that can improve both our imaging speed and our SNR efficiency. In addition, we have reduced SAR limitations, meaning we almost never reach the SAR limit of this system. And we also have a very uniform V0 and V1 field. And overall, that allows us more flexibility in the way we design our sequences. And of course, we have access to advanced image reconstruction methods and new artificial intelligence technologies. And these are becoming more widely available and can really be enabling technologies to improve image quality. So when we put all this together, we really have an opportunity to generate high quality images at lower field. So here's just one specific example. This is an ECG-gated spiral balance SSFP CINE acquisition at 0.55T. And so for this acquisition, we used a redundant spiral in and out with M0 and M1 balancing. And importantly, we used a long readout of 6.5 milliseconds and a long TR of 8 milliseconds. So this is really pushing the limits of the readout length and the TR for balanced SSFP beyond what we can do at 1.5T. And as a result, we improve our SNR dramatically. So when we go from 1.5T down to 0.55T, we expect to have about 37% of the SNR by polarization alone. But if we move to these more optimal data sampling strategies that are more SNR efficient, we can recover a lot of the SNR. So we measure it at 0.55T with the spiral and out acquisition, 70% of the SNR that we had at 1.5T. So we haven't actually lost as much SNR as we predicted. And this is for the same scan time, spatial resolution, and temporal resolution. The other thing we've been exploring is what we can do with advanced image reconstruction strategies. So here I'm specifically showing an L1 spirit reconstruction applied to a free breathing rebin CINE acquisition. And this is applied to the same patient imaged at 0.55T and 1.5T. And I actually think the comparison here is quite remarkable if you look at these two movies. I think that if I hadn't labeled them, it's quite difficult to tell the difference between the two. The image quality is almost indistinguishable. It's important not only that our images look nice, but also that we can get clinical diagnostic information at 0.55T. So we've been pursuing some clinical validation studies as well. And so far we've looked specifically at quantitative CINE imaging 
in both patients with known cardiac disease and healthy volunteers, and legality and enhancement imaging in patients with myocardial infarction. And the imaging of cardiac function and of SCAR are both very common indications for cardiac MRI, and therefore it's critical that we can make these measurements accurately. And the outcome of this pair of studies has been that both qualitative and quantitative interpretations of images at 0.55T and 1.5T were identical in uh, blinded image reviewers. So, so far, uh, these clinical validation studies are promising to indicate that we can use a high performance 0.55T not only to generate nice looking pictures, but also for routine clinical CMR that is used for diagnostics. Another thing we've been very excited about at the NIH are pursuing applications at 0.55T that are not possible or are very difficult using conventional 1.5T and 3T systems. So one example is lung imaging. Proton lung imaging at 1.5T and 3T is very difficult due to the high susceptibility in the lungs causing image artifacts. But by using this modern superconducting magnet design at 0.55T, we have a very uniform V0 field. And as a result, we can generate higher quality images in the lung parenchyma. So here I'm trying to demonstrate this by comparing a 1.5T image to CT, where you can see there's extra distortion in the 1.5T image. And by comparison, if you look at the movie on the right-hand side, uh, acquired in the same patient at 0.55T, you can see the really excellent image quality. And we're interested in both structural and functional imaging at 0.55T. So here I have a few more examples in a healthy volunteer and new patients of structural imaging at lower field strengths. And this is acquired using a T2-weighted TSE sequence. For functional imaging, we've been particularly interested in oxygen-enhanced imaging. And the reason for that is because the relaxivity of oxygen increases at lower field strengths. And so it's a very well-suited technique to lower field strengths. And with oxygen-enhanced imaging, we can generate these oxygen distribution maps. And I'm showing two examples here. One in a healthy volunteer where we can see strong signal enhancement, which is evenly distributed throughout the lungs. And then in a patient where we can see reduced signal enhancement and also heterogeneity within the lungs. And of course, we want to pair these oxygen distribution maps with regional perfusion maps to get a full picture of the lung function. And so far, we've been using contrast-enhanced perfusion at 0.55T. And here I'm showing an example in a healthy volunteer and in a patient with CTAP where you can see really clear regional uh, perfusion deficits in the lungs. So overall, this combined imaging of the heart and the lung we think is a very powerful way to probe the entire cardiopulmonary system. Another example of an application that is very difficult at 1.5T and higher field strengths is MRI-guided invasive cardiac procedures. And I'm showing an example of one of these procedures here. So this is a chemoablation experiment. It's a therapeutic procedure, which is being performed in a preclinical model. And you can see that the device is being navigated throughout the heart, and we're imaging that using real-time MRI. But we're also imaging the effect that we're having on the tissue in real time. And this is the real power of MRI, is to be able to see the effects of the procedure in real time using our flexible image contrasts. But the reason that these procedures haven't been translated uh, more quickly to clinical application is actually related to device safety. So we have two options to, of devices to use. One is to use the devices that are intended for application in an x-ray catheterization lab. The problem is that these tend to be long metallic devices and are therefore susceptible to dangerous levels of RF-induced heating. The other option is to use uh, devices made of MRI-safe materials, but these tend to be mechanically inadequate for the complex procedures. And the advantage of moving to lower field comes with device heating. So because heating goes with the square of the field strength, by moving from 1.5T down to 0.55, we've reduced heating on these metallic devices by almost an order of magnitude. And this has made a real difference in our clinical workflow. So here I'm showing a, our current clinical practice for a patient undergoing a right heart cath uh, in the MRI scanner. And this is a patient uh, that we are performing at the NIH. And although we've been doing this procedure in patients for several years, we now have the capability to move beyond just using plastic catheters 
and to start using metal devices that the interventionist really wants to use during these procedures. And so we've made a list of commercially available metallic devices that we've demonstrated are safe during uh, real-time SSFP imaging. And we can use them safely during these procedures. And this starts to really open the door to think about doing more complex procedures under MRI guidance using the standard tools that are readily available. So switching gears for the last few minutes, I wanted to mention the relaxivity properties of contrast agents. And this is nothing new because people have measured the relaxivity of contrast agents at many field strengths throughout the years. But specifically, I'm comparing here the relaxivity of clinical gadolinium-based contrast agents at 1.5T and at 0.55T, where you can see that for the most part, um, they're almost equivalent between field strengths. And this is important because in patients at 0.55T, we've been using standard dosing of contrast agents. But there are other contrast agents whose relaxivities increase as we go to lower field strength. And so I'm showing some examples of those here. Most notably, things like ablovar and ferromoxetol fall into these categories. And so here there's real opportunity to take advantage of the increased relaxivity. And perhaps we need lower doses of these contrast agents at lower field strength. And because this is the SMRA, I wanted to show a few examples of MR angiography. And the truth is we haven't done a lot of optimization of MR angiography at 0.55T just yet, but we do have a lot of the building blocks in place. So here I have just a few examples. First, here are two examples of gadolinium enhanced twist gradient echo imaging, and this is in healthy volunteers. And you can see that even though we haven't done a lot of sequence optimization already, the image quality is quite good. We've also been exploring what we can do with low-dose ferromoxetol. Again, because relaxivity is increased at lower field strength, we can generate really high-quality images with even a lower dose of ferromoxetol. And here's an example of the image quality applied in a preclinical model. And finally, here's a single example of a non-contrast time-of-flight angiography sequence. And this particular method relies on long T1. And of course, at lower field strength, we have shorter T1. And so in this case, I think that there's still some work to be done to optimize non-contrast time of flight imaging before it's ready for clinical application. So just to summarize, we're really excited about the opportunities using our high-performance low-field MRI system, both to make MRI lower cost and more accessible, but also to develop new imaging methods and to develop new uh, clinical applications or improve existing clinical applications. So with that, I'll thank the team at the NIH who have been working on this project, as well as our collaborators at Siemens. And I wanted to point out that we're hosting an ISMR workshop on low-field MRI next summer if you're interested in the topic. Thank you for your attention.